first surprise for the Nazis on the American Army front. The rocket-firing Sherman tank is shown for the first time. Shooting 60 four-and-a-half-inch rockets, a single tank matches the firing power of 15 batteries of 105-millimeter howitzers. From the rocket tubes mounted on the turret of the tank, the rockets can be shot singly, in groups of six, or all 60 in a continuous stream. More mobile than any other rocket firing device, the Sherman rocket tank can both defend itself and lay down a withering barrage. After six years in exile, Dr. Edward Benish, president of Czechoslovakia, leaves England on the first stage of his journey home. Czechoslovak units have been fighting with the United Nations on every sector. Now, as the climax approaches on the Eastern Front, Dr. Benish leaves to set up a new cabinet in preparation for the government's return to Czechoslovakia. Cologne, third city of Germany, gateway to the Ruhr, fortress for a thousand years. Today it lies in allied hands. The cathedral, though damaged, still stands. Its medieval glass is safe in subterranean vaults. It will be repaired. But the main railroad station, only a block or so away from the cathedral, is a hopeless ruin. Smashed walls and twisted track. There will be no trains in Cologne in the near future. Less than half a mile from the cathedral, the great Hohenzollern Bridge across the Rhine lies in ruins. Amid desultory shelling from the enemy on the far side, the civilians come out of their caves and shelters and gather round the bulletin board. One would think he was waiting for a streetcar. But no, there will be no streetcars in Cologne for a while either. Here is one of the great shelters built in nearby Neuss against Allied air raids. Now it is used as a dormitory. The houses are gone. Now it is a community center. From stocks hidden while German troops were still there, food is collected, distributed, and cooked in communal kitchens. Cabbage and potatoes. Prisoners in Cologne did not get cabbage. The water mains are destroyed. So from 9 to 12 and 4 to 6 every day, the Allied Army supplies water for civilian use. Housewives come with their pails. Some bring their washing down, as peasant women have done for centuries. Food was looted from hidden German army stores. But now Cologne will eat only what Cologne can supply. And Cologne, for the sake of its own stomach, is cooperating. Slowly, under military supervision and by its own efforts, Cologne is coming back to life. Here is Wehrmacht Major General Edwin Graf von Rotkirch und Trapp. He was a German leader in the Battle of the Bulge. It was his troops who surrounded Bastogne. American General Hugh Caffey, who defended Bastogne, here has the final word. And here is the German Volkssturm. They were left to defend the town of Harm with one German rifle and one smashed and discarded Schmieser gun. When the Americans came, they hid their armament and surrendered without firing a shot. They showed where their hidden guns were to be found. They led troops to the riverbank where they had cached three old flamethrowers. 
This was the Folkestone that was going to fight to the last bullet and the last man. As the American armies drove forward to the Rhine, they were met by another army, an Allied army that had struggled through five years of the most appalling hardships toward freedom. Poles, Czechs, Frenchmen, Russians, Yugoslavs. Some of them ill, some still suffering from wounds. All of them hungry, miserably clad and cold. These men, rotting in a German prison camp, had, on the approach of the liberating armies, risen and broken out made their way through the enemy lines toward their brothers in arms. Some had no word of home in five years. Some had worked in the German mines. But American medical authorities gave them help. The sick were cared for. The cold were given warmth the hungry food. Some of the prisoners wept. The French silently refused their cigarettes and offered them to the Russians. A camp for Russian forced labor was overrun and freed. The women had been better cared for. They had been more useful to the Germans, but they too had been uncooperative, so they were locked in cages. Then they are told the astounding news from the Eastern Front, how their comrades are on the Oder, how Russia has come back from defeat. When Allied troops reached the camp at which they had been held, the story was plain to see, quite plain. The first weeks in March saw Allied armies driving eastward to the Rhine, from Nijmegen down to the borders of Alsace. Near Geldern in the northern Rhineland, the vessel pocket is closed as an American infantry division and Tommies of the 53rd Welsh Division meet. They may wear different uniforms, but they are all part of the same great army. Almost without opposition, the town of Bad Godesburg is seized. It is here that one of the Hitler-Chamberlain meetings took place in 1938. There is less arrogance in Bad Godesberg today. The white flags are out. Only the snipers have to be cleared. The bitter final resistance. Methodically, troops go through the town. And by evening, it is in Allied hands. And here is everywhere the aftermath of battle. The homeless civilians, the wounded, and the prisoners. 110,000 captured since the start of the Rhineland offensive. As Allied armies drew up to the Rhine, they found that in the main, the enemy had done his job well. One by one, from Emmerich down to Bonn, the bridges had been blown. But south of Bonn, the little town of Remagen, by a great stroke of daring and good luck, a railway bridge was captured intact. Desperately, the enemy flung in planes trying to bomb the bridge. He failed. The German officer who blundered is said to have been shot, but the blunder had been made. Troops, tanks, guns, equipment of all sorts poured over the river to establish a bridgehead. Hurriedly, German troops were sent down to drive them back, but it was too late. Now the last desperate stand begins, but for the Rhineland, too late. For the Rhine, for Germany, for the Nazi party, too late.